We are live. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Rhetorical Composing uh, Unit. Uh, what unit are we in now? Three. Unit three. Uh, visualizing arguments, uh, or, or um, what are we calling it? Are we with <laughs> visualizing arguments with a cause. Um, okay. Wait, we're starting again now. This will be cut off. Okay. Do your welcome again. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Uh, ben McCorkle here, along with my colleague Susan Delagrange. Hi. We are on the OSU Mansfield campus, where it's a beautiful 60 degrees, uh, rainy, hardly any sun out, uh, but that's kind of how we like it. Uh, we're here to talk about uh, the, the unit where we're building PSAs. Right. Uh, unit 3, Seeing Rhetorically. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the, the parameters of the, the main assignment, uh, the associated kind of assets uh, that we've assembled for it. We're going to deal with some of your questions that you've uh, had along the way that you sent to us by email, and they've bubbled up in the uh, discussion forums. And, uh, and we'll talk about anything else along the way we think is, uh, is kind of relevant. Uh, so, uh, I, I will say that joining us uh, via Google Hangout are some of the other principal uh, players in uh, the rhetorical composing MOOC, and that includes uh, uh, Professor Scott DeWitt uh, from his home. Uh, we have uh, Cynthia Self. Uh, where are you, Cynthia? At your house? Okay. And, uh, and, we, and we have uh, Michael Moncato and Chad Irwitz. Uh, I think they're in the DMP uh, on the Columbus campus. So hi, guys. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so I guess the first, uh, there was some confusion about last week with the, the Google Hangout on air. And, uh, and, and we weren't able, for whatever reason, to get the content actually up on YouTube. So um, we're looking into that. Uh, Caitlin Clinton is talking to people at, at Google to uh, figure out where this thing might have gone. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, as we try to figure out those technical issues, we're also kind of working uh, to deal with them this time around. So I wanted to kind of throw it back to Chad and Michael to maybe talk a little bit about that. OK, yeah. So um, we have a couple of fail safes, I guess. Um, so if you're watching right now and it cuts out, be after this broadcast is finished, um, uploading a version of it to Coursera as well, so you'll be able to watch it that way. Um, but hopefully that won't happen. Hopefully this will this link will be great. Um, we're planning on that happening. Um, you'll be able to watch it later by using the same link that you use to watch it right now. Um, but in case it does go out, um, know that there will be a way again uh, very soon. Great, great. Thanks. So where should we begin, Susan? Um, well, we obviously are here to answer your question. So uh, we're going to begin with a question about the purpose of uh, a public service announcement. Um, and the question begins, I'm advocating, um, the cause I'm advocating is diversity in books, films, and movies. With a postcard or poster, I want to raise awareness about the inequality on this subject. And then the writer goes on to ask, is raising awareness a good enough goal, or do I have to inspire to take action? What kinds of actions should I inspire? Uh, the people who write and produce these kinds of things are the only ones who could take actions. But I want the public to be aware that not including certain people affects how they think about them and their role in society, and in the end, harms the relationships between people. So the, the basic question is, do you simply want to get people on your side for a particular argument or position or, or public service uh, uh, piece, or do you have to inspire them to actually do something after they see it? Uh, and, I, and I think that this is a good question because, uh, particularly thinking about the audience, because what you can do is to appeal to people to take the action of actually communicating with the are making these films uh, or make, writing the books or, or uh, uh, I, I guess, making the movies. Film and movies are, are uh, similar. Uh, 
And one way to communicate with them is to not patronize them. So a public service announcement could talk about not actually going to certain films or re buying certain books that, that do these kinds of things. So th there are different ways to think about your audience for this public service announcement. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's worth maybe even spinning out some possibilities in the discussion forum to get feedback from the crowd to see what people might think are relevant kind of uh, options. Uh, some are probably more fruitful than others, but another idea that occurs to me with this particular question is that you might um, you might uh, promote or propose a course of action such as uh, a letter writing campaign or something like that. So 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 the idea being that uh, people that would watch your PSA would be moved to write a letter that they would send to um, I don't know Hollywood studios or publishers of books or maybe they would send them all to your organization your pretend organization that they would then uh, collate and distribute that to the appropriate parties right. so that might be a theoretical course of action that you would follow as well right. um, one of the wonderful things about PSAs is they empower the consumer to do something um, rather than just uh, keep people aware of something and I think that that's really important. Right and I think the critical rhetorical lesson uh, given this scenario is that an individual consumer probably does not have a lot of power uh, in terms of kind of changing uh, uh, attitudes about cultural representation but collectively uh, you know this thing scales up in such a way that I think you could potentially have a real impact on, on this particular social issue. Right. Hope, hope that answers uh, that question. Uh, another uh, another interesting question on a different topic, and and uh, uh, this uh, writer asked um, in one of the videos you talk about context. What do you mean by context? Um, and I'll let Ben start with that. Yeah, uh, context is a word we throw around a lot when we talk about rhetoric, when we talk about teaching writing, uh, and, and and essentially it's, it's, it's everything around the text, it's everything associated with the text, it's all the information that's relevant to uh, but not in itself. Uh, con is a, is, is a root or a suffix is, or a prefix rather uh, means with, with the text. Uh, so, uh, so it, it could be things like historical background or, or culturally relevant information that, that uh, informs the text. It could be things like uh, attitudes that people have that they might bring with them to uh, their experience of the text. Uh, it could be uh, any of a number of things, but what right. else could it be? Um, well, I think when, um, in, in thinking about uh, creating an argument, whether it's a, through a public service announcement or a piece of writing or a speech, uh, that one of the um, one of the more most important things is figuring out um, where you and where your audience are in relationship to the particular issue. Uh, so the the context of the argument um, is going to be different depending upon who your who your audience is. Uh, one very important factor is whether you feel that you have a sympathetic audience who already agrees with you in some uh, in some way or another, but simply would find more information useful for them to also uh, to make a case, make that same case. Or you have a, a rather reluctant audience, someone who's going to disappear with you or dis disagree with you, not disappear, mm -hmm. disagree with you. Uh, and so the context there is going to require you to pay an awful lot of attention to the ethos that you bring to it, how you make yourself credible and um, and, seem, and having demonstrating that you have an awful lot in common with that audience, even if you don't right now share your perspective on this particular topic. Yeah. Does anybody uh, in our other remote locations want to weigh in on this idea of context? I think it's a central concern for, for any kind of rhetorical activity. Um, I have something, Ben and Susan. Um, one of the things that I think figures into context is language. Uh, I know that we're writing in English right now, but I've seen PSAs that are done in two different languages, the same 
uh, PSA in two different languages or a mixture like Spanglish or Chinglish and uh, depending on your audience, of course, and your purpose, you might want to think about doing uh, a PSA that has characteristics of two languages or maybe even three. I, I wonder, um, say you're dealing with a hostile audience, an audience who really, really disagrees with you. Are there certain strategies that you can use to, to win them over to your cause? I thought you were going to click on Scott. Oh, I, well, I don't know. <laughs> I, it seems like that question was for us. Like, how do you deal with hostile audiences? Uh, you know, uh, keep, keeping in mind that your audience might be a hard sell and that winning them over uh, is not simply a matter of pointing out that an issue exists, right? Mm -hmm. it, uh, uh, the, the trick is in, in, in the kind of, if we're talking about this genre, a 30 second PSA, how do you move? Uh, an audience that might not be inclined to support your cause to begin with. Uh, that's an important piece of context to bring into your thinking, your conceptualizing of the piece. Um, but uh, yeah, theoretically, um, I don't know, how, how would you approach that? Well, I, I, as I said earlier, I think this is, this is an ethos problem. Um, there's a, a rhetorician that we quote a lot named Kenneth Burke we talked about the idea of consubstantiation, you know, being of the same substance, being uh, with someone else. And what he meant by this was demonstrating through the way you approach talking about a topic that while you might disagree on this particular issue, there are other things that you have in common. So, so you can demonstrate that you um, also have a family or that you are very interested um, in um, environmental issues, uh, the, the, the kinds of things that show that you are similar to the person that you are speaking with and that you have common ground in which you can work towards um, a, an understanding of this subject, which means you're probably not going to convince them wholly to your side, but they will listen to what it is that you have to say. Right. That opens up a space to at least consider the possibility. You know, basically, you're identifying with your adversaries. You're identifying, uh, um, you know, with, with their belief system. Their their kind of their shared uh, your shared context, and then uh, and then hopefully bridging the gap. Because uh, certainly there are a lot of really divisive issues out there that seem as if they're at an impasse. Uh, the trick, I think, is figuring out how to break through that impasse. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to move on to a more practical que question that we had. Uh, one of uh, one of our writers, uh, I think more than one, was confused about what format they were to use because we had listed uh, a number of possibilities in the assignment. We talked about um, a, a poster or postcard-sized graphic that had text on it, and uh, then we talked specifically about a poster that might be of a particular size or proportion, at least, the, uh, the kind that we're usually, we usually look at, and those do have text and images on them. We talked about a postcard, and if you remember from um, the uh, video in which Ben and I talked about how to, how to analyze a visual text, um, that's an example of a postcard that has great uh, rhetorical weight. Um, and then uh, the uh, next option was a 30-second photo story, which would be along the lines of a, a, a slideshow, a, a series of still images uh, with text accompanying them or with audio. Uh, and finally, we talked about a 30-second edited video. So one of those or some other thing that, that occurs to you, we're not limiting it to one of those. Would, uh, would be an appropriate um, vehicle. And it kind of depends on your levels of expertise and comfort with technology, and also on what you feel to be most appropriate for the audience. Right, right. And this point bears repeating because, as Susan said, we, we, we're not draconian about this list necessarily, but we did kind of suggest these avenues uh, in large part because they kind of reflect 
how these texts look in the real world, right? I mean, certainly they're minute-long PSAs, but but a lot of them are 30 seconds. A lot, there are a lot of postcards. There are a lot of posters. So we tried to uh, uh, point to the forms and the formats that typify the genre, uh, because I think that's another important rhetorical consideration, is thinking about the generic expectations of the kinds of text you're producing, right? So, so in other words, if you are calling something a PSA, and it ends up being seven minutes and thirty seconds. That that really does not meet audience expectations for that kind of text, and therefore it might it might cause a little cognitive right. dissonance. It might might confuse people. Yeah. It might turn them off of your argument. Yeah. Seven minutes feels a, a little like a mini documentary, and a lot less like a PSA. There are also practical considerations for a PSA. Um, Video PSAs are usually made for television broadcast uh, and similar contexts. Well, TV is divided into 15-second sections, so if you want to buy time uh, or ask the uh, station to donate time to you for your public service announcement, they're going to have 15-second blocks, 30-second blocks, 60-second blocks, and you can buy in increments of, um, of the, it was 15 seconds, which means that as a generic convention then you need to make something that's going to fit within that time. Right, right. Would you call that context of a story? <laughs> sure, sure. It's uh, a, the con context of distribution. And, and another, another parallel example, I used to work in the newspaper business for a uh, for a few years before coming to academia, and, and we, uh, we would sell uh, advertising space, and you would portion that off and price it accordingly to the, um, you know, an eighth of a page, a sixth of a page, a quarter of a page, a full page, uh, you know, no no incremental uh, versions. You, you these were designated kind of space restrictions, um, and 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 so it's it's important to be mindful of those kinds of uh, uh, structures because they do circulate in our culture and they carry a certain weight uh, and and, uh, and and therefore they kind of shape expectation. Uh, Scott, so, did you like yeah, let me. Um, I've had these conversations with students um, on the campus of Ohio State, and one of the things that they always bring up that I think is really interesting is this idea of forum, or we might think of like the place of of where one of these appears, or the place of publication. And they always come up with these really great examples of um, where PSAs are trying to reach the same audience, and by audience I mean the, the same people, the same group of people, and they're trying to achieve the same purpose. They have the, they have the same outcome. They want us to act or react in a certain way. But how different the appearance of the PSA can be depending on where it appears. And so here's an example that one student brought up that I always then now subsequently bring up in my classes. Um, and so the difference between a poster that might appear in a waiting room of a doctor's office and the same message that might appear on a billboard. On a billboard, I'm driving by that billboard. Um, if I'm on the highway, I'm going at a, at a very high rate of speed. I'm probably drive, If I'm driving the speed limit in the United States, I'm going 65 or 70 miles an hour. That message can't have a lot of text. I don't get the opportunity to consume all of that text. So it has to be done in such a way with lots of visuals. It has to be done with single words or very short phrases, as opposed to sitting in a doctor's office where I might have been on time for my appointment, but I'm sitting there for 45 minutes and I'm staring at the wall. I have all kinds to take all kinds of time to take in information and what might be going on, and where the message and the audience are exactly the same. But the place of publication, that forum, really dictates the shape of the PSA itself. That is a great example, and I can think of a wonderful violation of that example. Uh, uh, there used to be, for a period of time, a billboard on uh, uh, Highway 23 on the way up to Marion. Uh, I forget what it was advertising, but it included a QR code on it. Uh, which, if you're familiar with this, this technology, it's, it's the, kind of the next generation equivalent of a barcode that you use smartphones and other mobile devices to scan in order to pull up content. So the idea that you would be driving down this uh, this highway at 65, 70 miles per hour and would be able to pull out your phone and scan this thing in passing, uh, it struck me as kind of ridiculous. It struck me as a real violation of, of genre in that in that sense. 
Um, so, um, length of a PSA, if it's a video PSA uh, or a slideshow that's running on automatic, um, is not a constraint. It's a rhetorical strategy. Uh, and you can use it to your advantage uh, in designing whatever kind of uh, public service announcement that you're that you're working on. Um, so um, it, while our um, while our assignments have suggestions, and you can move you know creatively around those suggestions. Um, your decision should always be based upon the purpose and the context and the audience expectations. Um, make it as long or short as you wish, as long as it meets those, uh, those rhetorical criteria. And if you do flout um, genre conventions, mm -hmm. you'd better do it in service of uh, what it is that you want to communicate. And that's the kind of thing that you can, uh, uh, hopefully not only will the product itself demonstrate that effect and that intentionality, but you also have another component in that assignment, which is the artist statement, uh, which gives you an opportunity to explain the rationale, uh, and, you know, your reasoning behind why you might have uh, intentionally violated convention. Um, so, so keep that in mind as well. Um, you want to talk about the military question? Um, oh, sure. Um, we we had a, um, a, a question from someone in the military who, uh, because of rules and regulations uh, where he's stationed, uh, did not have the ability to uh, upload video uh, from, from the base computer that he had to use uh, for for working on this course. Uh, and uh, this raises uh, actually a larger question, really, of what kind of materials and what means of um, moving those materials around uh, that we have for any of the, any of the projects that, that we're doing. Um, uh, so we thought it would be useful to talk about some other possibilities that might work for him uh, that may also be alternatives that you would uh, rather use, and some of them involve, actually I think most of them involve, for him, not making video, using some other uh, means um, of uh, creating a public service announcement that would uh, carry the same weight as a video, which was what he was thinking about. Uh, and one possibility uh, would be a photo story, which is a series of still images uh, that can be certainly created as a video that can also work very well as simply a presentation, like a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, and if his inability or anybody else's uh, inability is to actually upload things, a uh, possible solution to that would be using an online place in order to create the particular public service announcements. And we were thinking actually about the Google, seri uh, Google series of documents and presentation uh, and uh, spreadsheet programs that you can actually do online and then share, uh, which means that if it were done there and then the URL for that was shared uh, through WEX uh, in addition to a text artist statement, then people could evaluate it by clicking on that text and then finding it online. Just take it to the cloud. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah, it, one, one thing we weren't clear on with that particular person's uh, um, uh, query was how restrictive those, uh, um, those stipulations were. So, so I, I'm not, for instance, I'm not sure if, if video is just the threshold or if, he, if this person cannot download content of any type to incorporate into the project. Um, you know, at very uh, minimum, uh, it, it seems like you can replicate the spirit of this assignment in text. You know, you could write a very detailed script along with kind of parentheticals about the kind of imagery you would use. Uh, which, uh, you know, doesn't involve the kind of technical production that we originally imagined when we designed this assignment, but it still kind of works those rhetorical muscles 
and, and, and gets you kind of um, at least conceptualizing how you might integrate visuals, um, audio, video, and, and, and other, other modes. Right. And of course, the artist statement would be an opportunity to actually explain why you have created what it is that you've created, why it is a text rather than something that has visuals, um, so that your your audience, your reviewers in WEX will, uh, will understand what it is that you've done and be able to evaluate it on those terms. Uh, yeah, we we were brainstorming beforehand. I don't know if if, uh, if we glossed over or didn't cover some of the things that uh, our colleagues had mentioned, but uh, I don't know if you guys have any other suggestions as well. Am I muted? No, I am live, aren't I? Um, I I love that suggestion there about thinking about some limitations that you might be running into with your own access to technology or where you, you're actually, in this case, where, where this person is stationed. Um, and I think that we're all open to some interesting interpretations of the prompts. We never want those prompts to, feel, to make you feel so locked into a particular kind of text that you can't complete the assignment. So if, you are, if you're dealing with some limitations in terms of access and you see this prompt, and you can come up with some really interesting ways, and still, I like what what Ben was talking about. Still going through some of the rhetorical exercises of the assignment. I think that those things are great. And then what I love about this assignment is that artist statement is so that you actually get the opportunity to talk about what what limitations you are facing, what kind of constraints you are facing, and how you actually were still able to produce something that met the the outcomes of the assignment. Um, we'd also like to mention. Um, that I, I think just this afternoon we added another core video uh, to the uh, content for assignment three. And this is um, by uh, Caitlin, um, who one of our one of our team, uh, and I seem not to have written down what it's called, uh, but I think it's essentially Caitlin talking about artist statements. It's called artist statements with Caitlin Clinton. Yes. <laughs> uh, it, it was it was just added uh, I think yet uh, Tuesday. Okay. Um, uh, and this uh, it's a it's a wonderful piece about how to write artist statements, uh, which uh, we uh, overlooked as something that people might not be familiar with. So please uh, go back and and um, and look at that. Uh, and uh, we also actually wanted to, to uh, mention. Uh, that uh, there is a huge amount of content that I'm not sure that everybody is aware of that is in those videos. Um, and now some of them uh, don't, it, it, there's technical uh, advice, there's rhetorical advice. Um, each one of them represents kind of a mini lesson. And, and in those videos, is where we do a lot of our active um, active instruction, our active communication of uh, rhetorical principles, um, uh, methodology, uh, all kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just to just to uh, kind of touch on some of these because uh, what we were noticing in the discussion forums is that the questions kind of emerged that uh, then in many cases kind of get addressed or, 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 or at least kind of uh, discussed in some of the video content. Uh, so for example, there's an accompanying video uh, featuring uh, Susan here that, that actually walks through the assignment in, in, in a little more detail, kind of explains the thinking process that you could, would potentially employ as you work through the development of this assignment. Uh, uh, there, additionally, there's there's a discussion about the genre itself. What is a PSA? How does the thing you're creating fit within the overall constellation of these things that we uh, categorically refer to as PSAs? Uh, there, there's a how-to guide for visual analysis. Remember, one activity in this unit asks you to look at uh, um, you know, a, a PSA of your choosing and conduct a rhetorical analysis of it. The idea behind that is that uh, being able to think about already produced text helps you build the skill set and the habits of mind that you then end up internalizing so that when you produce your own visual text, you're applying that knowledge in a, in a different way. 
um, there, there's kind of a more um, kind of a broad history about the canon of delivery and how we've reconceived it uh, in the field over uh, two and a half millennia, basically answering the question, why are you in a class called rhetorical composing uh, uh, doing a, a multimodal visual text? I think, uh, you know, I think there's a legitimate argument uh, uh, to be had there. Uh, then also practical uh, uh, guidelines that have to do with uh, graphic design, you know, uh, good, good visual emphasis, uh, how to create balance and coherence and cohesion in a design. Uh, th those, are, those are good um, um, bits of practical lessons there. And then uh, also the aforementioned uh, artist statement uh, uh, piece that Caitlin has given us. Um, so, so, you know, I don't, I don't want, I know there's a lot of content uh, across this whole MOOC, but the idea is that these things kind of interlock in such a way that, that uh, there is intentionality behind it. It, it, it does fit together in an exquisite jigsaw fashion. Um, I, I've, I've heard a little uh, gnat buzzed into my ear and, and uh, I think Michael and Chad have an example of a PSA that they were wanting to throw up on the screen. So I am uh, going to switch to their, to their screen and see what they, are. what they have to show us. Okay, can you see it? <laughs> No, we could just see. Oh you. yes, yes. Okay, there we go. The social cigarette. Wait, there it is. It's back. Yeah. So we have an appearance. Uh, Kay Hausek has just jumped in. And she brought us this Ooh. wonderful PSA that she's going to okay. talk to you a little bit about. So is that is it in full screen? So it's pretty visible. Yes. Yes. Okay, excellent. So this is um, a PSA uh, that a student did in my spring semester course here in the Ohio State campus, and in that course we used exactly the same set of assignments that you all are completing for rhetorical composing. So for this second assignment, the student actually created this public service announcement entirely in Microsoft Word. Uh, and it's one of the reasons I brought it up as an example, because you don't have to have significant proficiencies in um, really sophisticated um, platforms or technologies. Uh, you can just create something like this because Word is a really flexible or um, the open source version of Word is very, very flexible. This is also um, an image if you did want to do a rhetorical analysis of this one, you could always come back to our office hours and put it up on the screen and do an analysis of this, um, this particular image. This student was really interested and spent her entire semester um, researching um, social media addiction, which is increasingly problematic um, in U.S. culture in particular. It may also be a phenomenon that we're finding globally. And so she was really interested in raising awareness um, for, and this was in her intended audience, was college students. Um, she imagined this piece being posted, say, for example, on the, the uh, bulletin board in a hall on a res in a residence um, building on the Ohio State campus. And so she was imagining it as a kind of quick going to or from the elevator or the stairwell um, or chatting with friends in the hallway. Uh, and so this is just, as I said, just another example of a PSA and a little bit about the context there. I do have another one too, but I'm not sure it's going to be very visible because it's big. <laughs> and I'm not sure, oh wait, okay. So this was one, You're, I'm going to have to hold it up so you can. Oh, is Okay, Let's we see go. you. Let's go. <laughs> is it backwards for everyone? No, for no, us, so, for us okay. it's good. Okay, for us it's completely backwards. That's weird. <laughs> so you can see this is a very long infographic um, that a student did. And this one I wanted to show you because um, it really entailed a lot of research on her part. Uh, she had to do a lot of research before she could even produce this PSA. And this is really this infographic. Um, and you can see it's like, did you know, I can't read it because it's backwards, Michael, can you read it? Did you know in 2010 <laughs> over 15,500 children were injured or killed by a gun? Uh, that's enough kids to fill more than 300 school buses and have this, uh, these images of school buses. See, show the three represents 100 school buses. And then she goes on to say... Every hour in the U.S., three people are killed by guns. A pie chart here representing that. Um, during seven years of the war in Iraq, 4,400 U.S. soldiers were killed. That many U.S. citizens are killed here by guns every seven years. 
all this gun violence, it's all because of the violent video games, isn't it? Actually, it's not. There's little to no correlation between violent video games and gun violence. We need to stop using games and movies as a scapegoat and start asking the right questions about gun violence in the U.S. Why aren't there more background checks before buying a gun? Why are guns so readily available to buy? Why do news stations give mass shooters so much attention? What's really going on, and what can we do to stop it? So, a lot of a lot of words, <laughs> a little bit of text, but this was intended for a sort of a context in which she would have a captive audience for a longer period of time. Here, I think she was imagining a space like um, maybe a waiting area in a doctor's office, uh, maybe actually at a police station. I mean, some place where people were. I'm going to be standing around a little bit longer and be able to absorb more material. Now, when this came up for peer review, because this was her first draft, when this came up for peer review through Wex in that classroom, she got a lot of feedback about the amount of text that was on here. Right? There was a little bit too much for people to absorb. And then they also weren't clear when she got to the bottom about exactly what her call was. What is it that she's asking us to do um, as uh, as members of the public in the U.S. And so one of the things she did when she revised this was to think a little bit more strategically about ex being a little bit more explicit about what her call was for her, uh, for the public. And that was a particularly compelling point for her to be thinking about what the function or purpose of a public service announcement is. So I like to think of it in those terms too. What, by the time someone finishes reading my public service announcement, do I want them to walk away with? What do I want them to be? aware of? Do I want to have changed their mind, their mood, or their will? What is it that I really want them to do when they step away? And sometimes we just want to raise people's awareness. In other situations, we may really want them to change their minds about a particular subject um, or their position on a particular subject. So just a couple of examples um, to get you thinking. <laughs> Thanks, Kay. What I, what I like about that, uh, that second example and, and the, those uh, um, those uh, criticisms, I think, are, are, are warranted. Um, but what I really like about it is that uh, it, it kind of has a nice surprising pivot. On like the first half, almost seems as if it's uh, if it's is setting up to be kind of a, a, a gun uh, control advocacy kind of infographic. Uh, but but then it, it it kind of takes that and pivots in a surprising direction to talk about the correlation or lack thereof. Uh, with violent, uh, with that violent video games, um, so uh, uh, very good. Getting a little um, jaggedy well, here. Yeah. We seem to be looking at um, uh, Chad and, and Mike, but we'll. Oh, here we are. We'll go on working, except we were, we've been reversed. Um, I it, the sound usually stays uh, stays certain, so we'll continue and we'll see what happens with our with our video. Um, we, one of the things that we wanted to, to mention um, uh, has to do with just what, what we're seeing already in the um, uh, in uh, terms of activity on uh, assignment number three. Uh, we already see a lot of activity with students sharing uh, preliminary drafts and commenting on them. So, um, so we thought it would be useful uh, to, to say a little bit, um, not just about the huge value of sharing uh, at an early stage and getting feedback, uh, but also maybe thinking a little bit about what uh, what kind of feedback is most useful at this preliminary stage. Um, I, one thing that I, we almost universally see is words of praise, um, and, uh, and and I think that that's a wonderful way um, to give encouragement to someone who's uh, nervous about what it is that they're doing, doing something that they've never done before. Uh, so it, it's, it's a great opening. Um, but but what, we're, um, what we're thinking about is, is what should come after that. Uh, and we know that eventually these, the final product is going to go through a, a review where re reviewers are going to be answering very specific questions and they're going to be answering it, them at length. And uh, frankly, if I were someone who, um, like all of our wonderful writers who had put something up there, um, 
at this particular stage in my composing. What I would love to hear is not only words of encouragement, uh, but also um, some, some, you know, legitimate critique and suggestions for how I can make it better. Uh, because I think that's, I, you know, that takes the, the warm feeling from the praise and moves it into something that will actually enable us uh, to, uh, to uh, make our own work better, which is, which is what we want to do. Right, and it's reciprocal too, because the idea is that uh, um, you know actually composing and revising and, and doing all that work of production uh, is kind of complemented by the other skill set that we're trying to cultivate in this in this MOOC, which is to actually get you to think deliberately about how to articulate uh, your reactions to the text as a, as, as a member of the audience. Right? How how uh, what's working for you? What isn't? Why? Um, and, and and it's encouraging from our perspective to see this activity already happening in the space of the MOOC uh, because you know it's coming uh, when when time comes to submit your work to WEX. It'll be a little more structured, a little more uh, um, robust. But um, but the hope is at the end of this whole experience that this is a mindset that you can take with you into the world as you uh, work on composing whatever it is you go on to write. Whatever. Constructive critique is a rhetorical act. Um, you can just barge in and say, you know, I, I think that you picked the wrong color for that, and you have too much text on your screen, and you, know, you can take that approach, and and that that's not constructive because it makes the person who created it uh, just feel that, that they. They are inadequate. There's a huge difference between that and perhaps phrasing it as a question. You know, I was wondering why you chose purple for your background. Um, I was wondering whether uh, more te uh, fewer words uh, on the screen underneath your image uh, might be uh, more effective because people seeing this quickly uh, will be able to absorb it all. Um, it's, it's something to, to think about. Uh, critique is a rhetorical act. Yeah, it, this is something that uh, uh, in traditional classroom settings I talk with my students about. Uh, uh, the, the act of critiquing itself is fraught sometimes with, with a lot of psychological baggage, right? People are afraid to put their work out there in front of others. Uh, some people are afraid of offending others to talk about work in a critical uh, light, and so what sometimes happens is is this kind of like very polite silence that pervades the whole experience, right? That uh, uh, you know pe people are are too afraid of hurting each other's feelings. And on one hand, that's kind of touching, but on the other hand, towards the mission of making uh, making the process more effective and efficient, and ultimately making the the end results uh, better. Right. Um, Cindy, do you have some experience with this or some something to add? You're muted. Okay, now I, I can you hear me now? Yes, yep. we can. Uh, you know, one of the things that I always think when I share my writing with somebody else is I'm, I'm very glad if they say a nice thing to start. I mean, it makes me feel good. But it does me no good whatsoever if all they say are, if everything they say is good. Because it doesn't really let me know how to make it better. And the, the whole idea for me about um, exchanging information about uh, writing is making the product better. So when you act as a collaborator with somebody or you act as a peer reviewer, your job is to help them make it better. That's your responsibility. Um, now, if you can make them feel good while you do that, that's a that's a very important point. But the responsibility is to help them make it better. And if you take that on yourself, then you realize you you share with the author um, just how hard it is to compose an effective text. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. I see your dog in the background. Yes, can I show you a PSA? 
while we're while I'm talking to you. I just want to show you one that um, because Kay shared one, I'll share a um, a, P a screenshot of a PSA that one of uh, the students that I worked with did for the same topic, which is gun violence. And I thought you might like to say, see two uh, PSAs on that same subject. So, whoops. Yes, right. Here. Okay, hold on. I'm getting there. There. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, so uh, this is Sushetta, was her name. And uh, she talked about gun violence beginning at home. And this was a one-page magazine um, PSA. So uh, she did a small research project where she gathered some statistics, just like the student that Kay worked with, and then created a one-page PSA that talked about gun violence and gave those statistics um, by way of making an argument. So I just thought it might be another way of thinking about it, and I love the graphic in the background. I thought it was very effective, a target with uh, red and the, the text in red that makes people think about violence and um, uh, gun violence in particular. So I just thought that might be interesting. Yeah, symbolically simple, but, it, but it's graphically very impactful. You know, it, 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 it's something that kind of... Uh, Catches the eye, especially the, the and of course the focus on children is um, incredibly important in, in in terms of the rhetoric of this. I also thought I also thought that if there are teachers out there, uh, public school teachers, who have to involve um, young writers in making research projects and writing research papers. This is a good way of getting a mini research paper into a course without focusing on a research paper that might take 10 or 20 pages. So that's another thought. Um, Chad and Mike, you're our directors here. How are we doing on time? Uh, we should probably wrap up soon. Um, is there any final comments that you all would like to make? Um, we do good introductions. We're terrible on conclusions. Yeah, just just uh, keep up the good work. Uh, I you know I have one, maybe one more uh, technical question um, that we might have we might have covered and is definitely on the what to do section as well of unit three. But um, there's been a couple of questions with um, just how to go about actually uploading um, assignment three because um, we've talked a little bit about the um, different sort of ways that you can save what you're doing. Um, but I'm sure you guys can answer this even better than I could. But um, there's those two elements. That's kind of an important piece, right? That there's either the image that gets posted into Wex, or if um, you know you want to share it in the discussion boards, you can post that image too, um, or the link. I mean, if you're not able to actually post the media, uh, you'll need the link, and then as well as the artist statement um, that's attached to that as well. And I think that's um, the two important elements. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's a good a good thing to emphasize. We do this year have more capability of uh, students uploading their projects directly to the Wix. Um, but uh, if they can't, uh, the fallback is to post it somewhere else on YouTube or some other vehicle, and then post the URL, um, and then the other a really important thing to keep in mind is that you actually have two things that you have to submit for this. So you're going to be submitting to Wix uh, either a project itself, image, video, text, plus an artist statement, or you're going to be submitting a URL that links to your, doc to your project, your PSA, and your artist statement. So uh, make sure before you click that final submit button that you have done both of those things. And offhand, I, I'm not sure, um, I can't recall exactly what WEX supports in terms of file formats, but I imagine most uh, uh, common, for example, JPEGs, you know, CNGs, 
uh, MOV files from right. movies and MP4s. Uh, uh, beyond that, I don't have a comprehensive uh, list um, right at the top of my head. Um, you know, one thing I would add is that file format is also rhetorical. And I think that people in the MOOC should think about that. The more common your file format means the more people can view and be an audience for your PSA. So really avoid any kind of um, exotic file format, one that a lot of people would not share. Aim for the most common denominator in your file formats. That would be JPEG or .MOVs or MP3s, that kind of very common, uh, easily accessible file format. And I might add that it would be a good idea to test your file with somebody else before you submit it. So if you've created an image and you have a JPEG and you have a family member or a friend, see if you can email it to that person or give it to that person on a JPEG and see if that person can open it up on a computer just to give it a test run to make sure that everything is working. If you're going to post something to your URL, um, send the URL to somebody and say, hey, can you open this just to make sure it opens? Because I think the last thing you want to do is submit something to Wex that you haven't tested um, and then something that's broken or something that doesn't work get delivered. Great. Good advice. Great suggestions. Um, OK. Uh, we're talking. We don't see ourselves right now. You may still be watching Scott also. Uh, but we're going to sign off now and um, look forward to uh, watching all of your submissions come in. Exactly. So we'll see you in a week. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. -bye. Bye. Bye.